morning's announcements. Um, just keeping our prayers. Um, Mary, uh, she's now in the Western Hospital, uh, Western General. We don't know which ward. Uh, we'll be trying to find out. Um, so far, the announcements are out. I've got a, a note. We may try and send a, a card off to her. Um, Dave as well. Dave Holden. Uh, he's waiting for a number of medical updates to do with um, proper shoes for him getting out and about and also other things. Let's keep Dave in our prayers as well. We also have the, the list um, on the announcements that's sent out on a weekly basis. This morning I'll be leading us in worship. Uh, reading this morning in place of Michael, who's not feeling too well today, will be Simeon. And the Lord's table will be Mike. And preaching will be Mark. And next Sunday, uh, Mark presiding. Uh, reader will be Mike. Lord's table will be Manuel. And preaching will be Simeon. Cleaning this week uh, goes to Colin and Helen, and today uh, it looks like it's Mark and Caitlin, is that right? In place of Joy. No, Joy and Nancy. Okay, right. <laughs> Miscellaneous announcements. Um, up in the Faith Mission, there's a, a short series uh, called Answer in uh, Genesis, or Answers in Gen Genesis, on the Friday the 24th at 7 o'clock in the evening and also Saturday at 10 a.m. and that's an all day. Um, and that's, that's the faith March. mission. March. March, March, sorry, yeah. If you want more information, I don't know if you sent an activity, did you? I just sent it to a few folks. Right, right. So it's probably in the announcements. Trying to get something printed up right. or a link to put in the announcements, something okay. like that. Yeah. So just watch any add-on to the announcements uh, this coming week. Uh, provisional rotor for the men for March is uh, updated version was emailed out yesterday. I did see that one. Um, again, need to make any changes, let Nick know as soon as possible. Also, oh, yeah, the one, don't get it in your inbox, check your junk mail, because yeah. man, emails are notorious for disappearing yeah. on the junk mail. Right, okay. Uh, just make sure you turn off your mobile phone, uh, tablets, any other noisy devices, except your voices. <laughs> so, I've got quite a few songs, but not all long songs, but... Um, just with my, my thoughts this morning. <coughs> so we're turning to our first song, uh, 419. You all probably saw the, wet, the news this week, terrible um, earthquake in Turkey and Syria. And just seeing, you know, some of the families waiting uh, amongst the rubble uh, to see if there's any of their loved ones or their families that have survived. <coughs> Again, for us, over in kind of this side of the world where we get the odd little tremor, but nothing as severe as over there, it is difficult to understand uh, that uh, looking at how their world uh, has collapsed more or less around them. Uh, they've lost their homes, and many have lost whole families. And yet we see there is still some good news. Uh, some are being pulled out even three or four days after the, the earthquake. So even amongst all that sad news, good news uh, is still there to be found. And yet people are helping those unfortunate people and families, uh, people from all parts of the world, are trying to race because time is important uh, to get over there and try and rescue those that have yet to be found. But from all, from all different backgrounds, they're all got one aim, uh, to try and help and save those who are lost. And this morning, you know, look around here, uh, they're all from different backgrounds. Uh, most of us know each other reasonably well but we have a common love for each other, hopefully, but also for the one we're going to be worshipping in song and in prayer and in worship this morning. In First Chronicles 16, verses 23 and following, Sing to the Lord all the earth, proclaim his salvation day and night, day after day. Declare his glory among the nations, 
His marvelous deeds among all peoples. For great is the Lord, the most worthy of praise. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the nations are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and joy are in his dwelling place. <coughs> Ascribe to the Lord, all you families of nations. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come before him. Worship the Lord in splendor of his holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. The world is firmly established. It cannot be moved. So let the heavens rejoice. Let the earth be glad. Let them say among the nations, the Lord reigns. First song I've chosen, uh, 419. If you're able to, we'll stand and sing this one. Lord, we come before thee now, at thy feet we humbly bow. O do not our suit this day, shall we seek thee, Lord, in vain? Shall we seek thee, Lord, in vain? Lord, Amongst all that devastation, destruction, heartache, loss, sometimes there's silence. You hear a voice, all the work stops, machines are turned off, and listen for that person or that child crying out for help. Now sometimes silence, as the, as the phrase says, silence is golden. Um, the world now is so noisy. You know, music, TV, the background, uh, headphones on, and maybe trying to blank out other noises. But it's not easy to be in a place where there's quietness and silence just to think. It might be your own room, it could be in your car. But sometimes we need that silence, that quiet place, just to think, pray, and be thankful that we're not in control, but God is in control. Psalm 46 and verse 10, be still and know that I am God. After we sing this next chorus, 685, sing it through twice and we'll have a few minutes of just quietness and then we'll be led in prayer by Simeon. 685, just tear a seat for this song.
grateful to you, our great and loving Father, for your goodness and your mercies upon our lives. Thank you for counting us among the living this day. Thank you for our death did not become our tomb. Thank you for your free grace, which is sufficient unto mankind. And thank you for another opportunity that you have given unto us. Together, again, as your children, to worship you in spirit and in truth. We pray, dear Lord God, that as we have come into your presence this day, we be able to seek your face in the name. Help us, O Lord God, that in our singing, in our preaching, and the prayers we offer before you, that your blessings will continue to remain upon us. Help us, O Lord God, that we do according to thy will. And help us, O Lord God, that at the end of today's worship, that we are not condemned for worshiping you in the wrong way. We commit as many of our brethren who seek thy face this day, as many who are sick, as many who are troubled, as many who are going through one problem or the other, we pray, dear Lord God, that you visit them at the point of their needs. We pray, dear Lord God, that you touch every one of us. You are the God that searches the hearts of man, and you know all our problems individually. We pray, dear Lord God, that as we bring them before thy feet, that you grant us answers to our problems. Help also, Lord God, that our problems do not take us away from you and send us into the world. Our Father, we pray that you continue to help us to see thee as the only one that we can turn to in times of need, in times of troubles, and in times of tribulation, and even in times of good. We pray, dear Lord God, that you cover us under the mighty wings. Do more than what we have asked of you, Lord God, for all this we ask through the name of your, through the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Next song is before 433. Yeah, even in our lives, we can all have uh, little earthquakes. It's an example that someone gave uh, during the week. You know, we all plan for things in the future. Uh, we don't know, only God knows uh, what's going to happen in our lives. But we expect life to go along quite easily. Um, but sometimes an accident can happen. Uh, we can lose our job. Uh, various <coughs> life changes. We could move off somewhere else to live. Uh, maybe a serious illness comes on us. <coughs> or the loss a loved one. These can obviously shake our lives and make us think and change. We might have felt secure one minute and the next or insecure. Our plans for the future might be in ruins. So where can we find hope when that kind of disaster strikes? You know, the people over in Turkey and Syria uh, if they're under the rubble, they'll be thinking, you know, who is going to come and save me? Do they know I'm there? Maybe it's going to be too late for some. But where can we find strength and hope amongst the rubble in our lives, the sin in our lives? In Philippians 4.13, the writer says, Paul says, I can do all things through him who gives me strength. The next couple of songs speak about, you know, strength and putting our trust in our Heavenly Father. Verse 4 of the first one, 433. My Jesus, as thou wilt, all shall be well with me. Each changing future scene I gladly trust with thee. Straight to my home above, I travel calmly on and sing in life or death. My Lord, thy will be done. Chris Mayer receives for this song. 433.
page the over 438. We're able to stand aside. I hope it builds on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest ring, but holy lean on Jesus' name. Set number 40. I said earlier on, just as the world's trying to gather resources um, to get uh, that help for the world, they're putting aside all their differences um, to collectively act as like one nation and help those unfortunate people. But sometimes there are obstacles in the way, uh, sometimes roads, roads might be blocked just lack of transport to get to those that actually need it out in the, the whole size of countryside. And it's like the good news of God's word. Um, today there are many obstacles in the world for us to try and spread the good news. Um, so much on television, social media um, that can sway us away from looking at the book that means so much to more, to more, to more too many people. But we need to leave it in God's hands to try and overcome these obstacles. Uh, there will be ways around that, but we must ask for God's help in these times. So just like the people who are asking for that help, we need to ask God for help. And the answers will be in God's word. And through asking God through prayer, he can show us, hopefully, the light in the world. In the world. So verses 1 and 2 of this song, Be with me, Lord. I cannot live without thee. I dare not try to take one step alone. I cannot bear the loads, load of life unaided. I need thy strength to lean myself upon. Be with me, Lord, and then if danger threaten, if storm and trial burst above my head, if lashing seas leap everywhere about me, they cannot harm or make my heart afraid. <coughs> Just in a seat for this song, after which Simeon will come forward and meet us from uh, Luke. Chapter 6. Be with me, Lord, I cannot live without thee. I dare not try to take one step alone. I cannot bear the load of life unaided. I need thy strength. Thank you. 
chapter 6 from verse 20 to verse 36. And it reads, And he lifted up his eyes on his disciples and said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you, you shall be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you shall laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you, and when they exclude you, and revile you, and spawn your name as evil on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day, and leap for joy. For behold, your reward is great in heaven, for so their fathers did to the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full now, for you shall be hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. Woe to you when all people speak well of you, for so their fathers did to the false prophets. <coughs> but I say to you who hear, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who abuse you. To one who strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And from one who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tonic either. Give to everyone who begs from you, and from one who takes away your goods, do not demand them back. As you, and as you wish that others would do to you, do so to them. If you love those who love you, what benefit is it to you? For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. And if you lend to those from whom you expect to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to get back the same amount. But love your enemies and do good and lend, expecting nothing in return. For your reward will be great, and you will be the sons of the Most High. For he is the king, for he is the kind to the ungrateful and the evil. Be merciful, even <coughs> as your father is merciful. Thank you. So we ask Mike to lead us around his thoughts around the Lord's table. Um, 380, 380. I said a few moments ago about, you know, uh, barriers and enemies uh, have come together to help these people. And it's something that takes that kind of thing to realise there are more important things um, in the world, you know, uh, humans helping human beings rather than uh, fighting and killing people. Verse 6 makes it quite clear why we're here today. Just as I am, thy love unknown has broken every barrier down. Thou to be thine, ye thine alone, O Lamb of God, I come. And that barrier is sin. And without Christ dying on the cross, there would still be that barrier. Uh, no bridge to span that chasm between God and man. <coughs> but thanks be to God. Um, even as the song says, just as I am, you know, as Christians we still sin, we still need um, you know, forgiveness. Um, but we are coming you know, broken needing help. So just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me come to thee, O Lamb of God, I come. Just stay in our seat for this song, and then I'd ask Mike to come forward. Just as I am
Ezekiel <coughs> probably had a close encounter with a UFO. Uh, at least that's what von Daniken thought. He wrote a book about UFOs in the Old Testament. Um, and indeed, this was in fact a UFO. It was an unidentifying flying object that Ezekiel saw. And the main word in that is unidentified, because flying objects that are unidentified are UFOs. Even Chinese balloons going over Montana, find out where the weather's like over Montana, it wasn't an unidentified flying object until they discovered what it actually was. Ezekiel was kind of disturbed, let's say, at the least, as to what he saw. Uh, but it began with a vision from God uh, in the temple, which is probably the most disturbing part of this entire vision that Ezekiel is given. Because he's given a vision of detestable idolatry in the temple of the Lord. Now you may wonder where am I going with this, what's that got to do with the Lord's Supper? Uh, well, I'm getting there. Okay. But what he sees, God brings him to the inner court. Remember, Ezekiel's away in Babylon. He's in captivity at this time. So God has transported him back to the temple in this vision, if you like. And he's seeing this from a distance. And he brought me to the inner court of the Lord's temple. There at the entrance to the Lord's temple, between the porch and the altar, were 25 men with their backs towards the Lord's temple and facing the east, prostrating themselves to the sun. They were idolaters. And this was happening in the Lord's temple. That shook Ezekiel to his core. Two chapters later in Ezekiel, because that was chapter 8, in chapter 10, you find that the Lord's presence leaves the temple and heads east. He moves from the temple to the east side of Jerusalem. And Ezekiel says, Then the glory of the Lord moved away from the threshold of the temple and stood over the cherubim. Now they were kind of scary angels. You don't want to meet one of them. They're not little flying babies with little wings trying to make people love each other. Uh, that's not what a cherub does. If you actually saw one, you would probably die. They're that scary. <coughs> So the Lord's presence leaves the temple, moves to the east side. Then the glory of the Lord moved away and the temp and, and the, from the temple and stood over the cherubim. The cherubim lifted their wings and rose above the earth while I watched. They went out along with their wheels and stood at the entrance to the east gate of the Lord's temple as the glory of Israel's God remained above covering them. So the Lord's standing on this strange looking vehicle, if you like. It was covered in eyes and all kinds of weird stuff. Um, and this is, again, it was a vision that Ezekiel's having. And he sees God moving from the temple to the east side of the city. Then the cherubim arose with their wheels alongside, and the glory of Israel's God remained above and over them. The glory of the Lord went up from the middle of the city and stood on the mountain <coughs> east of the city. Then in a vision from the Spirit of God, the Spirit lifted me up and brought me to the exiles in Chaldea, that's Babylon. At that point, the vision that I had been observing ended. The vision was over, and what Ezekiel saw was idolatry going on in the temple, with these men with their backs to the temple, backing away from God's presence and looking towards and worshipping the <coughs> sun. Idolatry in the extreme, in the worst place possible to do it. He says he saw them, God moving over to the mountain on the east side. You know where that is? The Mount of Olives. Now, this is one, one of the, my favourite prophecies, if you like, uh, because it's so powerful to think that God has moved his presence away from the temple, the most important place on earth where God met people, and he moved away to the east side. This is a vision that Ezekiel is having. Later on, later one of the minor prophets, Zechariah, prophesied this, his feet, and he's talking about the Lord here, the Lord God, he didn't know anything about Jesus back then, he was one of the minor prophets in the Old Testament, his feet, that is God's feet, will stand in that day on the Mount of Olives, east of Jerusalem, then the Mount of Olives will be split in two from east to west, forming a very large valley, with half of the mountain moving towards the north, and half towards the south, remember this is a vision he's having, uh, you can try and work out the meaning of all of that, but 
What it's saying is God is going to plant his feet on the Mount of Olives. And he's the Lord. Jesus looking at the temple and he was prophesying about its destruction in Matthew chapter 24. And this is what Matthew records. While Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately and said, Tell us, when will these things take place and what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? Jesus was talking about some extremely important things, especially the destruction of the temple, the very core of Israel's worship. It was all going to go. And he was standing, in fact, his feet were on the Mount of Olives. And he was sitting there looking back at the temple and started to teach them about the end of the ages. And you can read that whole chapter if you wish. Um, and two days after this, Jesus is arrested on the Mount of Olives. And they ripped him from one of his favorite places because that's where Jesus loved to go. He went there to pray, he went there to be with his disciples, to teach them, just to relax. Sometimes just to relax. He went there the night before he was uh, crucified, after the Passover meal. He went, he went to the Mount of Olives to sing hymns. Jesus' favorite place. So they walked from the house where they broke the Passover and they went up to the Mount of Olives to pray and to sing songs. And he's ripped from that that evening, taken away from his favorite place. And he was taken into the city to be tried very unfairly, illegally, and then crucified at Calvary. He's been moved from his favorite place to the most awful place, the crucifixion. We called it Calvary. It means the place of the skull. And there he was put to death. This was a disgraceful place, this Calvary. It was a filthy, unclean place. It was where they crucified the worst of criminals. It was where, when they were taken down off the cross, they were not allowed to be put into a tomb. They were not allowed to be buried with their families. They would be left to rot or burn the bodies or something like that, just for the animals to come and peck them and the skulls and the bones would be lying around. And that's the death that Jesus went through. And so even the name Calvary, we kind of think, oh, Calvary, you know. Uh, but it's a, it was a derogatory place. No Jew would want to be uh, put to death or have anything to do with the place of the skull where Jesus was crucified like a common criminal. And that's our Savior who went through that for us. Just like he left the comforts of heaven itself and came down to this earth as a slave, a doulos, the lowest of the low, to die for you and I. He also left his favorite place, the Mount of Olives on earth, to go to the worst place, to die for you and I. After his resurrection, he meets with his disciples, where about on the Mount of Olives, so he goes back there after his resurrection. And from there, he's also taken up into heaven from uh, Bethany, which is on the Mount of Olives. Acts 1 verse 12 says, Then they returned to Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives. That's after Jesus was taken up into heaven, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey. <coughs> well, I began with some evil men facing the east, looking towards the Mount of Olives, and worshipping the rising sun. We're here today because we face the risen sun. We face him. We join him there. We're united with him his favorite place, being at his father's side. Let's give thanks for the bread uh, that's for our heads. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for Jesus, who died for us such an awful way. Help us to realize his sacrifice, Father, and what he went through for us. And he loved us so much that he gave his life, and at such a young age as well, that he came here for one purpose, and that's to redeem us and redeem the whole of mankind. If they would just turn to him, Father, and face the, the risen sun, and not to be idolaters and to turn their back on you. We pray that you bless us as your children as we share in this bread together as we remember the sacrifice of Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen.
guys built to give thanks for the, for the day. Lord, we thank you that you loved us so much you were willing to sacrifice your very own son that we might have eternal life, Lord, and have a relationship with both you and him and with each other. Help us to reflect on the suffering that Jesus went through that he still showed love in his heart, still thinking of the people who put him to death and asking for their forgiveness and pointing them towards, towards you, Lord. Help us to do likewise, Lord, to point people to you and to Jesus as his only saviour, Lord, the only way they can overcome the evil of this world, Lord. And we thank you for the hope you give us through the resurrection of Jesus. He didn't remain in the grave, but he rose in power, Lord, and to give us this hope. And help us as we partake of this wine to remember the blood that was shed and the, the sacrifice that was made for us, Lord. Help us to appreciate that and to learn to love each other as well as you. In Jesus' name we pray, Lord. Mark your song book 7671. I'm singing the song at the end of Mark's lesson this morning. <laughs> I wonder if any of you have dealt with a similar situation before. Um, you're lying in bed at night, trying to drift off to sleep, as is usual for most people, and in the process of trying to go to sleep, your brain does this, this thing where it decides that going to sleep isn't actually the objective, and instead you should think about this very, very specific thing. I'm sure you've experienced it. I don't think it's all that uncommon. Um, my first thought in retrospect is, well, why doesn't that kind of thing happen when I'm going for a nap in the middle of the day? Admittedly, I don't go for naps all that often, and even more admittedly, that thought has absolutely nothing to do with my point today, which is, for the moment, that brains are weird. Returning to my primary story then, um, I'm going to try and tell you, when my brain brought the suggestion, I did the only logical thing anyone should do and could do in that scenario at 1am. I pulled on that thread and followed my brain down the rabbit hole. It's my brain. It's right after all. Right? <coughs> anyway, this initial thought was rooted in the concept of what if. And the first place my mind went was my old flat I used to live in about four years ago. Because without the landlord breaking up with his partner and needing to evict me so that he had a place to live, a whole lot of other events would have never taken place. If I hadn't been evicted, would Caitlin and I have eventually gotten married? More importantly, would Caitlin have come to know Jesus as her saviour? 
Yes, we were friends and Caitlin was coming to church events, but COVID struck a year after we started sharing a flat. If we've had to manage our lives through COVID, separately instead of together, would either, either of those things I mentioned have happened? The rabbit hole deepened and I was reminded of the fact that my mum was supposed to go to Australia with them and not come to Scotland. So what if that happened instead? Alternatively, what if she and Dad had grown apart, separated by land and sea, following a, a following out, a falling out? Certainly seems that Ashley, Adam and I would not be alive today. Still deeper we go, and I think about my granny and granddad. Without World War II, my granddad, who had a lady of interest here in Scotland, would have had no business being in an Austrian laundromat where he set his eyes where he set his eyes on the love of his life. My dad and four aunties wouldn't be alive. Irene would never have met John Rennick, and I don't even know enough of their history to figure out how that would have affected the church in Scotland. As you can see, this one if, this one what if spiralled, and then I was brought to the place where I want to build from today, which is Romans 8, 28. I read from the Amplified Version um, so I'll be including the little sections they add in. It kind of makes the reading a little more easier to understand and a little bit smoother sometimes. So Romans 8, 28. And we know with great confidence that God, who is deeply concerned about us, causes all things to work together as a plan for good for those who love God, to those who are called according to his perfect plan and purpose. We're not finished with the rabbit hole, because when I thought about that verse... I did something that I think is quite common when a, a lot of believers think of this verse. I thought, God has certainly worked all things for my good, even in the face of such tragic events. Almost as soon as I thought that, I felt terrible. Because all over the world, people all over the world lost loved ones during the wars and the pandemic. My rabbit hole came to an abrupt stop there, and I realized that Romans 8.28 can't apply in this scenario. There must, be surely, there must surely be more to it than that. After all, scripture isn't about me. Then I went to sleep. Quite the roller coaster of thought, and I felt I needed to really consider this idea around Romans 8.28, because while I can't remember ever really hearing it from anyone here, the impression I had of the verse was that people used it to make, them, make themselves feel better about good things in their lives and an attempt to humbly boast that they must be, in so, must be so in love with God and so aligned with his plans that their plans meet success. They would also use it to make others feel worse about the bad things in their lives, suggesting that they didn't love God enough or weren't aligned to his ways enough and so their plans were doomed to fail. And while that wasn't the way my rabbit hole went, I wasn't far from that point of view. It's very easy to get caught up in the prosperity gospel movement if you, if you take that mindset when reading verses like Romans 8.28 and I feel like this is the first thing I need to draw a line under. In all the commentaries I read trying to look into this, one thing was emphatic through all of them. Context. As with most passages of scripture that gain mainstream Christian attention, the context is almost always disregarded. And if your idea of Romans 8.28 leads you to think of, about it in these terms, then you're taking it out of context. There are two contexts I want to look at this from. One is the context of Romans 8, and the other is the context of Scripture as a whole. What is the context of Romans 8 then? Well, that in itself is a little bit awkward, because the chapter starts with, therefore which means that there is a continuation of, a pr of the previous thought, which is in chapter 7, which in itself starts with a continuation of a thought. The idea that scripture should have been divided into chapters and verses was both obsessive and convenient. Using that convenience, we'll start with the end of chapter 7, and Paul talking about the battle of mind over body, and the want and need to serve God and fighting against the flesh and its desires. Chapter 8 then starts with one of the most rousing messages in Scripture. Therefore, do 
there is now no condemnation, no guilty verdict, no punishment for those who are in Christ Jesus, who believe in him as personal Lord and Saviour. For the law of the spirit of life, which is in Christ, the law of our new beginning, has set you free from the law of sin and of death. Chapter 8 begins by reminding the listeners, or the readers, that we have received a wonderful gift through Jesus coming to earth and completing the law. But within that reminder, he emphasises the need to be in Christ. This emphasis is found throughout chapter 8, with being in Christ, or in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit being stated repeatedly. This is interlinked with the concept Paul spoke about in chapter 7, and the battle between flesh and blood, no, flesh and spirit. Except in chapter 8, he doesn't mean himself, but every believer. For me, there are two key themes throughout chapter 8. The first is suffering. Not the overt suffering from things such as physical pain, although it is in there. Instead, it is the internal struggle between spirit and flesh. Now, the mind of the flesh is death, both now and forever, because it pursues sin. But the mind of the spirit is life and peace, the spiritual well-being that comes from walking with God, both now and forever. The mind of flesh, with its sinful pursuits, is actively hostile to God. But it does not submit itself to God's law, since it cannot, and those who are in the flesh, living a life that caters to sinful appetites and impulses, cannot please God. For if you are living according to the impulses of the flesh, you are going to die. But if you are living by the power of the Holy Spirit, you are habitually putting to death the sinful deeds of the body. You will really live forever. And the other far more, pro far more prominent theme is hope. For in this hope we are, were saved by faith, but hope, the object of which is seen, is not hope. For who hopes for what he, have, he already sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait eagerly for it with patience and composure. What then shall we say to all these things? If God is for us, who can be successful against us? He who did not spare even his own son, but gave him up, for us all. How will he not also, along with him, gracious, graciously give us all things? And if we are his children, then we are his heirs also, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, sharing his spiritual blessing and inheritance. If indeed we share in his suffering, so that we may also share in his glory. For I consider from the standpoint of faith that the sufferings of the present life are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is about to be revealed to us and in us. Paul's message here is clearly drawing from Jesus' own message in John 16, 33. I have told you these things, so that in me you may have perfect peace. In the world you have tribulation and distress and suffering. But be courageous, be confident, be undaunted, be filled with joy. I have overcome the world. My conquest is accomplished. My victory abiding. And the final verse I want to draw out is Romans verses I want to draw out is Romans 8, 35 to 39. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? Just as it is written and forever remains written, for your sake we are put to death all day long. We are regarded as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all things we, have, we are more than conquerors and gain an overwhelming victory through him who loved us so much that he died for us. For I am convinced and continue to be convinced beyond any doubt that neither death nor life, nor angels nor principalities, nor things present and threatening, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the unlimited love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. There is so much to unpack within Romans 8 that we could easily go through it in a series of lessons, and so there are sections that I haven't touched on, predominantly because they do need a little bit more of time to discuss. But 
what then does the context of suffering and hope mean for verse 28? As a better way of informing myself, I felt I needed to look into what scholars had, had to say on the matter. And almost unanimously, they, are de they all declared that it is a message of assurance. The key themes of the chapter are suffering and hope, both of which can be identified in the verse 28. We know is a statement of emphatic understanding, but it is still grounded in hope. In all things alludes to both blessings and sufferings. However, there is more to it because there are two caveats. We have to love God and be called to his purposes. In other words, we need to be in Christ. I said it was emphasized throughout the chapter, so why should this verse be any different? If we are in Christ, then we love God and have been called. As a result, we have been set free from the law of sin and death. And though our body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if we are children, then we are heirs. And the Spirit helps us in our weakness. In all things, we are more than conquerors. All these things mentioned come in the face of that some of, of, in the face of some kind of suffering or negative experience. And yet, in the end, nothing separate can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord which is as good as it gets. If that was the context of the verse as it pertains to Romans chapter 8, what is the context within the entirety of Scripture? Well, I think for this we need to establish who Scripture is about, which sounds like the start of a philosophical discussion, but it's not quite the direction I'm going. I mean it more in line with such questions like, who is Harry Potter about? Or who is Sherlock Holmes about? Both of those have very obvious answers. Harry Potter is about Harry Potter and Sherlock Holmes is about Sherlock Holmes. The answer is right there in the title. So who is the Holy Bible about? Well, I think the answer is right there in the title too. The answer is found in 1 Samuel 2, verse 2, from the praise of Hannah. There is no one holy like the Lord. There is no one besides you. There is no rock like our God. Many believe scripture to be the story of a nation and their relationship with their God. But it's about the one true, but it's actually about the one true God and his relationship with his chosen people. If we see the story from, of the Bible from that perspective, it all becomes clear. Throughout scripture, we can see that God uses good and bad events, good and bad rulers, good and bad normal everyday people to work out his plans. Cain, Ahab, Nebuchadnezzar, Judas, and Saul were used as much as Abraham, David, Ezra, John, and Peter. Yes, Saul turned to the light side and became Paul, but all that for all the further but all that further proves is the redemptive power of God if people turn to him. From the creation, God has utilised whatever was available and or necessary to achieve, achieve his plan that was completed in Jesus. Galatians 4, 4 to 5. But when in God's plan the proper time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the regulations of the law, so that he might redeem and liberate those who are under the law, that we who believe might be adopted as sons, as God's children with all rights as fully grown members of the family. The reality of, Je of Romans 8, 20, 8, 28, when viewed in the context of scripture as a whole, is that God works all things for the good of those who love him because he already did it. In Jesus. The greatest good there is, is God and his gift of grace. However, much like the misapplication of Romans 28, this idea can be misapplied too. Some think that if God can work and does work all things for good, then my behaviour doesn't matter. If I just keep living my life the way I want, then God can just fix the problem for whatever he deems good. But in truth, it means the exact, exact opposite, as Paul clearly states two chapters earlier. 
What shall we say to all this? Should we continue in sin and practice sin as a habit so that God's gift of grace may increase and overflow? Certainly not. How can we, the very ones who died to sin, continue to live in it any longer? Or are you ignorant of the fact that all of us who have been baptised into Christ Jesus were baptised into his death? We have therefore been buried with him through baptism into death, so that just as Christ was raised from the dead, through the glory and power of the Father, we too might walk habitually in, new in, in, in newness of life, abandoning our old ways. In the end, the content of my late night thought spiral had nothing to do with Romans 8.28, because it doesn't really mean anything to my physical life of existence. If anything, my thought spiral correlates better with perhaps, and perhaps enhances part of Matthew 5.45. For he makes his, he makes his son to rise for he makes his sun rise on those who are evil and on those who are good, and makes the rain fall on the righteous, those who are more morally upright, and the unrighteous, the unrepentant, those who oppose him. Because in the same way God makes the sun shine and the rain pour on good and evil, sometimes good people suffer in the sun and bad people prosper in the rain. When Jesus completed the plan of salvation, he fulfilled so many truths written in scripture before and after his ascension. Romans 8.28 is a message of assurance, the kind of assurance we can only receive from God. As long as you love God and have answered his purposeful call of being in Christ, then all things will work out for your good, because in Christ they already have. If you are in Jesus, then be assured it all works out in the end. Thanks, Mark. Just being up late that night and just thoughts to think for us this morning. If Mark Mark's last thoughts have changed the heaven, as a presider can do, because <laughs> I'm in charge. <laughs> Uh, 71. Okay. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God, born of the Spirit, washed in his blood. This is my story. Again, talk about, you know, Mark and his thoughts, going back to his kind of life story um, and how he got there. I'm sure we'll all be thinking about that in our kind of rabbit hole after the service today as to how did we come to where we are now. Again, God's got a plan in our lives. Um, one day he might be leading us to someone who's still looking for that good news. So we stand and sing, and uh, that will close our service in prayer. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God, born of his spirit.
Father, we're so thankful that ble- for that blessed assurance we have in Christ. That as we live our lives as you have called us to live them, as you have instructed how we should live them by being faithful to you and by following in his footsteps, that we are assured victory is ours in whatever we face. Jesus has made it possible for us to be with you for eternity. Whatever happens here on this planet is only here temporarily. But for all eternity, because of Christ, we have a home with you. We are so grateful for that assurance. We thank you for our time together. We pray that we have encouraged one another. We pray that we have offered our hearts to you in praise and been acceptable in your sight. We ask you to forgive us for those things we do when when we fall short, when we sometimes are caught unawares, and uh, although we fall to those temptations, we pray that you will strengthen ourselves, that we will look to your word and find ways of defeating the temptations that come our way. When we do succumb, that we look to you for forgiveness to offer our hearts again in repentance. That we might walk again with Christ, assured of that home in heaven. We pray, Father, that we can open our hearts to those around us, that we can share the good news of Christ and what he is, what he has done and what he is doing, and what he has promised for all who would follow him. Go with us as we leave this place and help us to share what we know with those around us. We pray for the world at large, Father, that you would bless those who strive to make the right decisions. Help them to have the wisdom 